Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the Holocaust Center for Humanities Lunch and Learn program. I'm Alana Cohn Kennedy, the Holocaust Center's Director of Education. A live transcript for this program is available on Zoom for anyone who would like to use it. Click Live Transcript at the bottom of the screen and then click Show Subtitles. When you visit the Holocaust Center, we ask you to consider the land on which you are standing. The Holocaust Center for Humanity in downtown Seattle sits on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. Thank you to our community partners, the Washington State University, Dutch in Seattle, and the Women's Century Club. Thank you also to our 2021 series sponsor, the Tacoma Jewish Community Fund. The Holocaust Center is proud to announce the upcoming publication of a graphic novel based around the life of local Holocaust survivor, Steve Adler. As part of this project, we are inviting the community to help us choose a title for the novel. The poll will run from July 13th to the 23rd, and there are three titles from which to choose. When the voting finishes, we will choose a name at random from those who voted, and that person will win a copy of the final novel when it's published this fall and a framed print of the cover signed by artist Sean Doherty and the authors Julia Thompson and Paul Regelbrook. For more details and to participate in the poll, please visit our website at holocaustcenterseattle.org. You might have attended or might currently be attending a middle school or high school named after someone. In Washington state, there are lots of schools named after presidents and others like Kennedy, Jefferson, Garfield, for example. There's also Whitman, Denny, Eckstein, Jane Addams, and Einstein to name a few. In May of 2021, it was announced that a new middle school in Spokane would be named the Carla Pepperzak Middle School. When the school opens in 2023, Carla Pepperzak Middle School will invite its students to draw inspiration from its namesake, a woman who fought the Nazis to save Jewish people during the Holocaust. At the age of 18, Carla Pepperzak joined the Dutch resistance. She helped to hide and ultimately save the lives of several family members, as well as other Jewish people. She created false identification and ration cards and helped to publish an underground newspaper. While Carla and her immediate family survived the Holocaust, 18 of her family members did not. In the aftermath of the war, she met her husband, Paul, a Dutch Catholic. And in the decades that followed, Carla lived and traveled across the world with her husband who worked for the United Nations. In 2004, she moved to Spokane where she later met Dr. Ray Sun. Dr. Sun is an associate professor of history at Washington State University with a specialty in Holocaust and genocide studies. Taken with Carla's remarkable story, Ray began working to write her biography. We are honored to have with us today both Carla Peppersack and Dr. Ray Sun. Carla and Ray will take questions at the end of the program please feel free to type in your questions at any time in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Thank you so much, Carla and Ray, for joining us today from Spokane. Hello, everyone. And I wanna say it's such a pleasure to be with you, um, the viewers, and also with Carla. And I have to confess, this is the first time that Carla and I have been together since on um, the fall of 2019 due to the pandemic. So it's a really special day for both of us, I think. Um, so Carla, why don't we just get going? And why don't you start by just telling us a little bit about your background, about your family, when you were born, where you grew up, um, you know, just situate us there. Okay, I was born and raised in Amsterdam quite a few years ago. Uh, and I, um, had a very happy childhood. I had one sister, a uh, year older than myself. I actually even enjoyed school. Uh, I enjoyed sports. Um, I, when I was 12 or 13, um, I was um, I joined the rowing club. Uh, this is, by the way, a picture of myself at the uh, my final year in high school. Uh, anyhow, um, 
so I was a unhappy youngster and, and had a nice family life. Yeah, I, I'd like to um, focus on this picture for just a moment, Carla, because I think rowing is such an important part of your life. Could you tell us a little bit about why you became interested in rowing and about the club Poseidon? Well, actually, I, I, everything was water I like, but I really wanted to row. And uh, I like from my age, I had to be 14 uh, to join. And I, I said I was 14 and I was 13 and they accepted me. And I did a lot of it. And I met, of course, very nice friends. I already had friends there. It was not a Jewish rowing club. However, the majority of members, I would almost say 95% of members were Jewish because the Jewish uh, other uh, rowing clubs, uh, they wouldn't allow Jews to enter. So, but like I said, it was not an official Jewish club, but it, we had many Jewish members. And of course, all, many of my friends were Jewish. And by the way, as a youngster, I did go to the Reform Temple and of course met many more Jewish people. So uh, here you saw the picture of me entering. I was, I didn't say it was the, was the third one, the first the one from the last one in the picture. Um, and um, so I was 16 when the war started and, and I was still in high school. I did my final exams actually when they were bombing around the country, though Amsterdam was not bombed very much, it was still a little. And they postponed the oral part of, uh, about a month. So we, uh, you know, because it, it was such a uh, tremendous affair what's happening and uh, they did uh, continue school. But anyhow, I did my final exam uh, in, uh, in June. Uh, uh, Invasion was in May 1940, uh, later than uh, the one on the Eastern Europe, which was uh, in, in 1939. Um, and I had a role actually at that time uh, for to go to the University of Amsterdam to study metal technology. And I could do that for about a year. But after that, they, uh, the, Nazi government had all Jewish uh, university students. I mean, actually, you could not even continue at universities uh, at the university as a Jewish student. Uh, they had, uh, Jewish youngsters for high school and uh, elementary school had to go to their own school, that uh, from uh, their own Jewish school. So I did. Uh, started studying in the University of Amsterdam and after a year I had to quit. And so yeah, so that's a that's a really good point because um, things gradually changed over the German occupation. So um, tell us a little bit about how um, things were right when the Germans came in um, in the summer of 1940 and then how things gradually changed as they get harsher right. and harsher right. towards the Jews. Uh, in the very beginning uh, there was no change. And uh, the, the German government, the Nazis appointed immediately a Nazi government and the queen and the, uh, those who could fled to England in the five days that the, the war was taking place. The war was from the 5th of the 10th of May. So the, the German did form a government and the own, uh, head of the government uh, actually was a general size inquiry and he was there all the five years. Right, I want, I want to interrupt you for just a sec here, Carla, because uh, we have this image. Uh, I think maybe you took this picture of the Germans putting up um, street signs, but, but why did they have to put up the street signs? Well, because they have to give them directions. And if they would ask the local population to for directions, they would give them the wrong directions. And uh, of course, they didn't. But so there's a form of quiet uh, resistance. Uh, right? That was the very beginning. I remember right. my sister being very proud of the fact, because she spoke German very well, and so did I, by the way, that, you know, to give him the wrong direction, that was really very, right. very funny. And so uh, now we're looking at a picture. It's dated July of 1940. So this is just um, two months after yeah, the after Germans the invasion. invaded. And this is in a this is in a cafe in Amsterdam. Well, in the restaurant, actually near right. the river, you saw there the Amstel River. Okay. And 
and that time, you know, people are still, Jewish people are still allowed to go to restaurants. But what happened here, we were sitting there, and this is my father who has right his there. head. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, this is my father. Okay. Right? And my father who put his head down because two German soldiers came in and he was very concerned. Right. And then next to my father is my mother. And then the fellow who is standing is a person who became very high up in um, the uh, underground. And then my sister and her bow and those. Uh, he actually was born in England and was later on sent to a camp, but not a Jewish concentration camp, but a war camp. Right, and so we, we, we see that right now, things seem normal, right? Mm -hmm. We see the German soldiers at the next table, uh, but everything seems to be normal. And it's, so it's, it's, yeah, it was at, the, at that time still normal. And another couple of months and in September actually, was when it really okay. started difficult to get. Uh, they uh, started, number one, the Jewish people had to register because uh, they did not have a special registration of Jewish people in, in the Netherlands. And that was in September already. And, okay. And about 158 Jewish people registered at that time. 158,000. Uh, yeah, 158,000, right, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. And not everybody did. And those who did not and uh, were uh, not betrayed and were lucky and actually uh, kind of Jewish people at the time uh, did not really uh, go to services or anything. And they, uh, and they managed to get, some of them got through the war without, uh, you know, being uh, sent to camp. But there were only a few of those actually. And so after uh, September, it uh, also then not only that every Jewish person had to register, every Jew, uh, the, uh, also the, the Jewish businesses had to register. And of course, I did my father's business. Okay. Uh, and then a little bit later, um, then of course the Germans actually um, separated the Jewish population. We're, we're looking at a picture here of a, of a Jewish star that- Right, um, actually- everywhere. Yeah, what happened uh, in, about, in 1941, they, uh, everybody had to, get, and everybody, hold on, not only the Jewish people, over 15 years of age had to get an ID and um, show the ID card and blah, blah, blah. And um, the Jewish people got an ID with a J behind the, uh, in their, in their identity in card. Their identity right. card. And, and then they had to start wearing, start wearing the star. Here is my identity card. And actually this is the second one. I had the first one was with a J next to my name. And uh, later on my father, because my mother was not born Jewish, he managed to a German uh, attorney and uh, there's actually a book written about this attorney. Yes, it's very interesting. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, Miguel, who wrote a book list in Seattle. Um, anyhow, he um, managed to get a new ID for me. So this ID is um, about a year older than uh, the other IDs were. So by that time, I was lucky and I did not have to, to wear the star anymore. Right, I think we it have a picture of you wearing the star. Right, right. Um, and the second from the left. Right there, right. okay, right. with your friends, okay. And this was actually visiting this young man you saw, um, my, my sisters, so he was, they were not officially engaged but visiting in, in that camp. And uh, we could visit and it was basically right. a war camp, like I said. Right. Really. Uh, so, so you were able, your father was able to get um, an identity card without the J. Right. And then of course, then you didn't have to wear the star. Right. And so this enabled you to go around in public um, freely. Right. Right. Yeah. So, uh, and also by this time, and this was in 1942, the, um, I, I should have said about my education, by the way, um, I did join when I could not stay on at the university. I did join um, 
uh, I went to a, a small private college, a medical technology college, and that it was private, so we they did not have to follow the rules and regulations from the government. And because of that, I um, uh, actually got myself a German nurse's uniform, which came in handy later. Yeah. And, but but um, sorry, let's talk about my education. I interrupted yeah. myself. We were talking about uh, being able not to go and wear this, this star and doing things. But in, in 42, they also, all the Jewish people were not allowed anymore on buses, trains. Uh, uh, they could not have their own cars. And by the way, they confiscated from the Jewish people all their bank accounts, the, uh, the, all the accounts they have. So also the uh, accounts in uh, investment accounts, etc. And they give him a little stipend. And of course, my father lost all his money too. And though he put some money aside, I think he knew probably what was happening. Right. I think 1942 is a very, very important yeah, year. Absolutely. Because not only that they made all those restrictions, they also started slowly, uh, you know, rounding up people. Now, when I was at the rowing club, by the way, and I mentioned there was not a Jewish mm -hmm. rowing club, and this was early, this was in February 1941 right. already. They, um, uh, they, that was the very first Razzia in, in uh, Amsterdam. 400 young Jewish men, or young Jewish people, and only men and uh, uh, boys were rounded up, and uh, the rowing club, I was in, uh, they came in and, and on, I think it was a Tuesday afternoon, and they rounded up six of my friends, and uh, not one of them ever never came, came back. back. Right. But, uh, well. So this, uh, this was the very first time, and actually what was interesting, that after that, the population of Amsterdam got so upset, and they had all called a major strike, but uh, the Germans uh, pretty, you they know, so put yeah. it down and killed the, the top leader, so. Right. Yeah. So um, they were starting to do roundups even in 1941, but in 1942, That's and this right. is something that your many of your viewers um, may be more familiar with if they've read the diary of Anne Frank in the summer of 1942 is when the Germans began to uh, um, collect Jews from the Netherlands uh, and send them east to the death camps. And so, at the same time, uh, it looks like you, you got your new passport and were able to go uh, without uh, a star yeah, that was in the late time. summer or early fall of 1942. Yeah, and so yeah. that, that's when I think you began your rescue activity. Yeah, what really happened to do is that the Germans started rounding up the Jewish people and they actually were some, sent first in the Netherlands on the east side of the Netherlands to a transfer camp, Camp Westerbork. And so all the Jewish people who were rounded up went by regular train usually to this camp. And um, actually, I, my then people also, the Jewish people, tried to start to go into hiding and find hiding places. And the brother of my father, uh, his name is Lo, and his family, he had two little girls, asked me to if he if I knew a place where they could go into hiding. And that's how, and by that time I was about 17 and a half or something, I got involved with the uh, underground because I, I didn't know a place, but I knew a person I could ask. And so I found a place for them and we were able to uh, put them into hiding. So I wanna, I wanna just um, interrupt for a moment here. Sorry, Carl, but you're 18 years old. You know, it's the fall of 1942 and um, a relative asks you, and how long did it take you? I, I assume that they asked you in, in, in a, your apartment, you know, in a room like where right. you, um, how long did it take you to make that decision? Because this, this, is, this is the major decision where you, you went from being um, passive to being a rescuer. Immediately. Right away. Right away. There was no, no doubt for me. Uh, I was very fortunate that I have had the ID without a J, 
and that I was free uh, and could do things. And so um, my family, my parents were always very hospitable, but also always helping other people. And I think that was part of my makeup, that I was, uh, if people asked me for help I, and I could do it, I did it. So there was no doubt, I think it was the same day that I tried to find a place for them. So, um, had, had you actually considered, I, I hadn't thought about this before, but had you actually considered that someone might help you? Had that thought occurred to you before that someone might ask you to help them? Or was this, was this a surprise? When, when you no, it was a complete surprise. Okay, all right. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, it wasn't the surprise that people wanted to go into hiding. But that, that, they that, that they asked me to. Do okay. That. So uh, we're looking <laughs> now at a picture of your, your cousin, Lutya, um, and there's quite a story behind how you rescued him. Um, yeah. could, you, could you tell us about that? Um, this is an aunt of mine who uh, her husband already had been picked up right in the street and, and sent to camp in, uh, you know, either Germany or Czechoslovakia or Poland, wherever. And um, she was left with five kids, and then they came to get her. Now, this was maybe early 40s. <coughs> Anyhow, um, I was mentioning um, that I had this German nurse's uniform, which I could have, which, which I bought. I also had a German nursing ID card, which I had actually stolen and filled out in my. Uh, 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 here's a picture of a German nurse's uniform, not me, but uh, anyhow, um, I, um, she co neighbors called me that they had been picked up and that they were in this train and they were on their way to Westerbork. Now, this is the central station in Amsterdam and it still looks the same, at least 50 years later. And I put on this uniform and um, I went to the railroad station and met her. I found her in the train. I knew what time, what time the train would be arriving. There was a regular train, and they used to put, you know, them in. On the, I guess there was guards all over. Anyhow, uh, I asked her. I said, "Can I take your little one, who the youngest one was two years old, with me?" And of course, she was only too happy to give him to me. So I took him out of the train and actually I was stopped by a German soldier. And I uh, did speak fluently German at the time. And, and it had to be because I was wearing a German nurse's uniform. But, um, and I told him that was my little boy and I had to, uh, he was sick and I had to get him to a hospital and I was on my way to do that. And they let me go. So I was very fortunate. But the problem was I had this little boy, I could not absolutely not take him to my parents' home. And, and I actually was li living part-time, most of the time with my parents. So I had no other. So we had to find a place for him to go into hiding. And this is a picture of him uh, uh, after the war. He was five, oh, he was about six, seven, I think. Uh, anyhow, he was, oh, he was five years old when he came out of hiding. The problem was that he, he was sent from one family to another, and he had learned how to fence for himself by stealing and lying. And he was very difficult when my parents got him, and they put him, of course. They wanted to adopt him, but they, they could not. The, the, the war uh, infants of the war children in Holland, uh, the, the, US, uh, the Dutch government kept being in charge of them. But anyhow, they, of course, they were taking care of him and he went to school and they really, and he had to go to another school and another school because he could not stay. And at the end, he uh, even, you know, when he was about, my parents really, my father took care of him the rest of his life. He was about in the twenties and he got married, he became an artist. And, um, Eventually, he had to play uh, on the suicide. He, he was just, he never it's got over it. He never, he never got over it. What happened to him? And the rest of his family, his, the rest of his siblings. Uh, his everything was, everything. Everything, they never killed him. Right. right. So, uh, but going back to people in hiding. So, I tried, you know, to find this place for my uncle and aunt, and they had two little girls. 
and of course, at two years old and at four or four or five years old, could not stay in a room all day and do. That was just impossible. So uh, they fortunately did not look very Jewish. And we uh, found also a place for the little girls to go into hiding, just a home. And it wasn't really hiding, they were part of the family. And the, uh, the host and hostess said, well, they were cousins, you know, their, their cousins. So they, were, they could live a normal life. But one of them, the older one, had, um, was also changed from one family to another, but she was very, actually very happy in the second one and they were very good to her. And they kept really uh, in contact all the years. But after the war, I did not know where she went into hiding. And so uh, my, my aunt and uncle came out of hiding and with the other little girl, and they asked me to find her. And I knew approximately where she was, or where we had originally put her in now. And I uh, asked, a, I got to know a, a Canadian officer who had a Jeep. And I asked him if he would want to take me over to that area and you know, try to help me find him. And he did so. And in those years, immediately after the war, actually, when uh, and you know the Canadians, by the way, uh, liberated the northern part of the Netherlands, which was seven months later than the southern part was, uh, uh, was the the armies were stopped in, in September forty one in Arnhem. The middle of Arnhem is an interesting book. Anyhow, I, um, I mentioned that the, you know when a, when you have a Canadian and a jeep. They always had candy with them and the kids would immediately surround the Jeep and ask for candy. So uh, this happened actually when I was with him and one of the kids asking for candy to point it out, she said, Carla, she recognized me. She was by this time, I think six or seven years old. And so she found me actually, instead of me finding her, and it was, you know, I, later on, uh, actually in 2017, I met her in Holland, we went to Holland for a reunion. And she told me the story, I had completely forgotten about it. But she said, you know, I, I asked you to twice, because mm -hmm. I to. And I, there are some pictures, and I wish I thought of, the, of them now. But anyhow, um, they are now, they are, both girls are still alive, and I have not much, but contact with them is, you know, email once in a while. So that's good. So they, it's they a did wonderful, make it. Yeah, yes. they, they did make it so. And uh, yeah, that's quite a story there. Yeah. Anyhow, going back to people into hiding, yeah. you just could not, uh, you know, you, you could not ask the host and hostess family to feed you, uh, everything was rationed. So one of the things we had to do is, uh, and I got those from the underground, uh, they usually uh, stole those or, you know, from rationing centers to get them a rationing card. And this was a song we, you know, this came every month I had to go there and bring them the card so they could get food. Another thing we had to do, give them new ID cards and ID without a J. Uh, and I got those from the underground, by the way, so did I get the rationing card from the underground. And those ID cards, um, and as you saw the ID card before, was my uh, wrong one. Um, uh, it's in the bottom. Can we put this on? How can we show that ID? You want to see yeah. the ID card yeah, again? Yeah, because of the, well, there is a fingerprint on one side. And to make those ID cards, we um, got them, actually, they printed them in England. They dropped them by at night. Yes, yeah. the idea. So this whole card, uh, you know, was printed in England without, of course, anything on it except the numbers. They put the numbers on on the on the top line, and we uh, made them. The other people who went into hiding, I made false ID cards for them, uh, keeping the uh, birthday the same, but sometimes changing the names. If it was a very Jewish name, but I would we would keep the same initials. So if they had a ring with initials or any or a handkerchief with initials, they could keep that. And then the um, 
by the way, this is the ID card I had when I have used the German nurses uniform. But going back to the, uh, the, the ID card, um, I um, made about a hundred of them, not for everybody uh, who I helped in hiding, but for other people too. And I, they had a little machine to make the thumbprints and um, the, um, uh, and I became quite good actually in making them. But I always carried, or always, when I needed to use them, I carried the ID card and the little machine in a little suitcase. And one time, and this was in 43, I think, uh, I was being uh, interrogated by two German Nazis. And uh, like I said, I spoke, I spoke German very well. And I also was at the age that I, um, knew how to flirt with them, so I really flirted with them. And um, they let me, you know, they apparently they were satisfied with the answers I gave them. And then when they left, I had to leave too. And I picked up this little suitcase with the ID and a little IDs in there and a machine in there. And one of them was very polite and he said, let me carry that for you. And I'm still thinking how, how worried I was that he would open it and that, you know, or <laughs> oh, it, it would, would fall open. And it would, unfortunately, <laughs> right. nothing happened. So, but that's the story for my ID cards. That is that right. is fabulous. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so let, let me just um, try and pull things together. So you were you were a very busy person in those years. You were, right, you were busy yeah. supplying. And I was uh, the people that you I hit. going to school officially. and going to school. At, and at I'm missing a lot of my, oh, my, my exams. I had to do quite a few over again because I, I just right. either miss it. But, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Not enough, not enough time. Right. So um I'm assuming that um the people that you hid, they're they're hidden in various um, places. Most of them are outside of Amsterdam. Is that, is that <coughs> the right? ones I helped? Excuse me, they're all outside of Amsterdam. Right. So how did how did, you get to, um, how did you um, reach them when you had to supply them with cards or? Well, I did most of it on the bicycle. On the bicycle, right? Because even if, if I could go on, on uh, you know, um, the uh, on the train or a bus, it was still much safer to go on the back. And especially if there was somewhere, you know, they, 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 in the middle of the street, they would stop people. And if I saw that at a distance, I you you know, turn around, turn yeah. around, or took another street, a side right. street. So the bicycle wasn't enough. And there is a little story to that too. I don't know about the torture that the underground uh, raided the sugar factory and gave me some sugar to pass around to people who were in hiding. And they gave me some, let me have some sugar so I could barter them for new tires because my tires were getting old and we couldn't buy tires. So that's how I got my bicycle tires by sugar. Which right. was stolen. Trading sugar, yeah. stolen sugar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're you're forging you're forging documents. Mm -hmm. You're you're dealing in, in stolen sugar. You were just a, a criminal uh, element. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I would visit, by the way, the people who were in hiding all about once a month, unless they needed something else. Sometimes they needed medicine, and thanks to the fact that I, you know, was studying and I had to do work in the hospital. I could get it right. sometimes. So, so yeah, there, there's several interesting things going on here. <laughs> and this is partly why I was interested in, in your um, athletic background, you know, with the rowing club, because you were obviously in really good shape. Um, you know, I, I assume you need some strength and stamina to be bicycling around the roads around mm -hmm. Amsterdam, you know, month after month after month. So I think that set you up pretty well for that. Right. And I also think what set me up for discipline. If you're all in a four, like I the picture you saw, you have to be the at the same moment go into the water and mm, out of the water. Right. And and you know you have to follow whatever they tell you to do, otherwise you may drown very eventually. Yes. So anyhow, I think discipline was taught to me by you know, right outside my parents by you know, right self discipline yeah. and, and mm -hmm. um, right. working for a goal, um, and also being a woman. Uh, I think probably helped. It wasn't that unusual to see women biking around during the day. Right. right? No, you saw them all the time. All the time. Uh, young men uh, after the age of 19 
And I, I think after 43, you saw very few young men on the streets because they were uh, the Dutch young men, the non-Jewish young men, were sent to labor camps to help with the German war. Right. Effort. So if you'd been 20 years old and as a man viking yeah. around, you would have been snapped right, up. Right. You would, unless right. you could prove that you had some reason that you, like my husband, was an agriculture. Right. So for a while, he didn't right. have to do that. So. So. So um, in the Netherlands, um, at the, the Jew, about 80% of the Jewish population actually perished in the Holocaust, which is the highest rate in Western Europe. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but you managed to save um, every one right. the of one, the, the Jews that you rescued, right? right. About 40 uh, of them. Right. I was very fortunate. It's remarkable. That, yeah, the, yeah. But I suppose we had the right hiding places. And they have the right neighbors. <laughs> right. I mean, it wasn't just you. Obviously, you, you need <laughs> no. neighbors who didn't talk. And, and, right. And also, yeah. you know, because of the people not have, uh, having an uh, or having an ID and uh, not having to wear the star, of course, they probably would go out at night. I also meant not to go out in the daytime, but in the evening. They right. Did. And that they were themselves, of course, very careful. Right. And, uh, so, um, I just want to bring this towards the present now. So, um, you know, for, for many years after the war, uh, I know you didn't talk about this. Um, so you only began speaking about your experiences to schools and, and to my class, for example, in the past few years. And could could well, you past explain? Eight, seven or eight years. Yeah. So, so why, <coughs> what changed your mind about this? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Excuse me. Let me get some I, to, to start with, I was one time asked, this is when we live in Sri Colorado Springs, by a friend who knew that I had been actually, and Frank, I knew and Frank, and, uh, and I, we lived, to, before they went into hiding, we lived less than a half, one, one block from them, and they went to the same, uh, she and her sister were in the same uh, uh, temple, and uh, temple of the Hebrew classes. Anyhow, and, and they knew that, and somebody who, well, they were in that school, they were performing a Frank play. Oh, yes. And they asked me if I would talk to the cast just about life, uh, what I knew about Anne Frank. And I did that. I uh, did not go to the performance. I still can't see it. I mm -hmm. still have a very difficult time with movies and anything. But that was the first time, actually. And then my, my granddaughter here in Spokane, who was in school asked me if I wanted to talk to the school, and I said yes. So that was the very first time. That's before I lived here. Right. And then when I moved here, and after 2004, um, I was very, you know, involved with the Jewish community. And one of the gals uh, was by the name of Eva Lassman, who did a lot of talking in schools and mm -hmm. universities. And uh, we got together, and we actually did one of the one, one program together. Mm. And then she was not well enough to do it anymore. And then one of the schools asked me if I would want to do it. And that's how this, yeah. And then I realized after doing this a number of times, I did not want to talk about it, by the way, for 50 years because it was too painful. And I, you know, I had sleepless nights, etc. cetera. And uh, then I realized that it's terribly important that people hear about it. So that's how I actually spoke more and more, and I've been speaking for a lot of And you've been speaking a lot. Yeah, not years. the last two years. Not, not last year, but and, yeah. And, and, and so I, I, I missed that. I, uh, oh, yeah. And yeah. so um, your your efforts were recognized. Um, you, you were um, honored by the Washington State Senate a few years ago, and then in 2020, as we can see from the slide here, Carla, you were, you were honored as Washingtonian of the year right. um, from the governor's office. And here you are receiving your award from um, your state senator, Andy Billig, right. and mm -hmm. uh, the lieutenant governor at the time, Cyrus Sadiq. So right. um, I'm sure this is the furthest thing from your mind in 1942. Uh, <laughs> you would and I, I still yeah. think, you know, I, I, like I said, I'm not a speaker. I do like to talk to the kids, and I sort of have a rapport, especially with the young teenager. I really enjoy them, and uh, uh, but uh, that, that they get an award for that. I think that's just 
Uh, it's it's like so what is it like super on the cake or whatever, but uh, it's really not necessary. But, um, right. Well, it, it's good to see that very grateful people are, are are recognizing what you're doing and trying to show you that we appreciate it. Um, let let's close off, and you can have the last word. So, um, what do you want um, your audiences to take away when you when you speak to either a class or or like today to um, an audience around around the state? What what do you want to, to become to really with? knowledgeable on the Holocaust? To talk about it, and, uh, and I think that it's so important if you know what happened because you really don't want ever to happen this again. The Nazis were evil, and, and I think the you know, more you know about that, and it really happened. There's no question about it. Of course, it, you know, it happened to me. And if you can talk to friends, etc., and then I always like to finish my talk with the word respect, because if you can respect each other, then those things can't happen. And even if you don't understand the person, if you don't like them, but the opposite of hate is love, but that's a, that may be difficult. But if you can respect that per person, then no genocide can happen anymore. And that's really what I like to get across. Thank you. And I do want to mention, I did write my memoirs and there's a little book form for that, which you know, I can get. Here, why don't you hand, let's show it in the book. Yeah. It's called Keys of My Life and you can get it on Amazon, right? right. Also on Kindle. Right? On Kindle too, that's right. So, um, thanks Carla and uh, Anna. I, I think we're ready for questions. Wonderful, thank you both so much. Um, and Carla, thank you for sharing these incredible stories and your, your memories of this time. We have a few questions for you from audience members, but I, I wanna start with one um, that I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about, and that's, when you were asked to help other families, and I, I love your response to Ray's question, which was, do you know, did you, how long did it take you to think about it, you know, to decide? And you were like, I just made the decision. And I'm wondering if you and others knew what was going on, like outside of your city or in greater Europe, like how much, how much do you think people knew about what was going on in the rest of Europe? And I think we partly knew about it. We knew about, of course, the concentration camp because even people, they would in the beginning let people send cards back to let them know that they are still alive. How bad it was, we did not know. But um, the, the, the danger, of course, in Holland for the Jewish people, we knew about it. And we knew about how important it was maybe to, you know, either to flee some people, I had a boyfriend, their family fled and they ended up in the States, my brother-in-law fled. Uh, but, uh, you know, instead of going to camp, going to hiding, about 25,000 people tried to go into hiding. And not many of them were betrayed. So not yeah, I think about 15,000 came out of it, which is a pretty good percentage. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So there's, a, there's another question here, it comes from Greg, and he asks, um, he says, it's incredible to me that we can see photos actually taken by Carla herself at that time. How do you still have those photos and how, how were you able to keep them? Yeah, the, 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 I had one picture album, which I somehow my mother saved and it moved everywhere with us, it's falling apart now. And um, actually, one of my daughters took pictures of the pictures. And so uh, I still have it though. And actually, the Holocaust Museum in, uh, the, and Frank Institute in Amsterdam want to have them. And I wonder, some of them I think I'll donate to the Holocaust Center because I think you may want some for your museum. Wonderful. It's an um, There's another question here, and it asks, uh, what is the secret of your well-being, Carla? And what is the single most important trait, in your opinion, of a person trying to live successfully and work in a repressive state? I didn't get all the questions. My successful being. 
I think partly is genetic, partly is a little exercise, and partly is um, diet. So it's um, also the rowing. Yeah, the rowing that you did so when many you years were But I do swim. I keep You're on still swimming. swimming. I still swim. So you, you do love I, the water. I swim the other. That's yeah. the way And then what was the next one? That's good advice. So the other the other part of the question is, what? How can a person live successfully and work in a repressive state? In a repressive state. So um, you were able to um, keep on going. Yeah. I think partly is it was my way of fighting the Germans, and and the real big part was it's, you know the people needed help and, and I could do it. So, and also I did not have my own family. I mean, I had my parents and my sister, but I, did, I wasn't married, I didn't have any children. So I had, you know, a more, basically more philosophical freedom. Hmm. And uh, I think that's part of it too. But uh, the main part was, you know, the need was so, so high to help other people? That's a good question. I'm wondering, um, I've actually never asked you, uh, did you ever take time off, you know, to relax or, well, you know, the, try and have fun? Very little, because number one, at night you could go out at all, it was curfew, of course. And number two, most of my friends were gone. Right. And number three, there was no food or anything to, to, so to not have much a party. To so, yeah. no, there wasn't that much. It was very, very little. No. That's a good question, Ray. Yeah. Um, so Carla, the next question here comes from Mark and this is quite observant, but he wants to know, is the necklace you're wearing today the same as the one of you in the picture of your youth? Oh, is the, the necklace that you're wearing, uh, is it the same no, one my, that you're my, wearing? No, no, this, is, this has diamonds and the other one was plain. <laughs> but my husband gave that to me years Richard, ago. Richard, could we pull up that um, original picture? I th is that the picture when Carl the very, was in school? The very first one. Yeah, the first up, picture. Right. Yeah. No, it's not the same. Okay. Not the same one. All right. Mm -hmm. Pretty observant. Um, another question comes from Teresa, and she asks, did your neighbors know what you were doing? Oh, there's the necklace. Oh, there's the picture. There's, oh, that's, yeah. that is very observant. Yeah. yeah, well, but it's, it's definitely yeah. different, and I don't even, I, I, I think it was gold, but it was not, uh, no, no diamonds, no diamonds in it. Okay. And I, I was way too young to wear diamonds in those years. <laughs> so there was a, a question. Right. Uh, oh, so, yeah. Yeah, repeat the, the next question um, from Teresa, she asks, did your neighbors know what you were doing? I hope not. Uh, one, one set of neighbors, yes, because they were the ones I fully trusted and went to it the very first time. Hmm. They, are, they were the ones who brought me in to connect me with the right people. And by the way, I mentioned that very first picture where you saw my uh, cousin, uh, he helped me also to find, and they really, he was very, very helpful too. So, um, but, um, um, no, my neighbors, most neighbors had no idea. And my parents had no idea. That's to say, I never talked to them about it. I do not know how much they knew or not knew. But uh, we never talked about it. So Carla, how, how did people in the underground communicate with one another? Like how did you how did you get messages back and forth to each other? Uh, well, I also did some courier work, and that was one the ones you were very close to. You, you made an appointment or you, you said, we'll meet there and there. And so you met some people, you, you know, and other people, you know, I'm showing my hands. I would have a piece of paper which was cut this way and I would go to somebody else and I had to give them the message and they had the piece of paper which was exactly fitting, cut the other way or cut at the same time actually. And so that was one way you would know that you can uh, recognize each other and that you could pass the information. Mm. So it was all word of mouth. We never used the telephone. We never used anything written. That's why I don't have anything written. We uh, just, you know, on connections. 
And by the way, I, I remember some more time about it. Oh, we saw yeah. some time. Yeah. The, the bulletin. Uh, I, I not only that I got in, you know I got involved with the on the guard, but they also asked me in Amsterdam we printed a um, bulletin. The all radios were confiscated, and the news was very one-sided. Of course, it was all German news, and they asked me. Uh, we listened to the radio London every afternoon at six o'clock. In Dutch, they would give the information from the Allied side, and we would print a, a bulletin and mimeograph that all and pass that around. And that probably was more dangerous work than uh, people having to help people in hiding. Of course, you know, if, if you are caught uh, passing those bullet, you know, the, so it usually was one sheet of paper on both sides and the news. But that was another job so I did. How, how would you distribute um, your bullet? I would go, you had some places where we go and leave 20 people we knew. Often stores. Oh, you so you give it to a storekeeper you trusted, and yeah. they and would they, pass and it they on. They knew to that customers. people, and they would pass it on. I yeah. see. I, I yeah, they won't go door to door. Oh, I did. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And did you did you know of people who were caught, and what happened to them? Well, we never knew what happened until after the war, that unless they were killed right away. There was another camp in the Netherlands that I called the name of Furcht, and they would send uh, uh, people there, those uh, many undergone workers who were caught. Uh, some of them were, of course, they were all very much interrogated. Some of them lived, but many of them died. So it was very, very dangerous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they were sent to that camp in, in the southern part of the Netherlands to Furcht. And there, so, there were actually, um, there's, I think, always the threat of informers. Well, that did, is the did, worst. Did you ever think yeah. that you were well, being followed or being informed on? Well, you always were very, very careful. We had, of course, the Dutch Nazis. And we didn't talk about after the war, the one picture right. uh, from the Dutch Nazi. Um, I don't have really have time to talk about it. Um, no, we, probably we, not. Anyhow, yeah. Uh, yeah, you were always worried and you were... I, I, I don't think I ever lived in those years without being worried. And that makes you very careful, of course. But I also, and I was young enough to have hope, and I realized the Nazis were so bad, it was so atrocious that they couldn't continue. I was convinced that they would push the war. And we were very happy when America entered the war. So I was happy when uh, Pearl Harbor happened, you know. It's a strange way to be happy about, but we were very glad, very grateful that America got into the war because we knew that Germany never could continue. Mm. So at the end of the war, Carla, what what was that? What were those first few months like when the war was over? It's very hard to describe with tremendous relief. Like like a, 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 a big box was removed from your head. It was, yeah, it, it, uh, we were overjoyed. A, a joy you can hardly believe, you know, it could happen. But it was, the main thing was the relief. So, yeah, we were just people singing in the street. I'm not that type, but. Uh, <laughs> did, did you tell your parents after the war what you had been up to? Well, a little bit, but not much. The inter or this is after the, war. the interesting thing is we wanted to forget things. Right. And of course, I got involved with having my the, the, this niece uh, or this cousin of mine. Right. Uh, oh, this is a picture yeah. immediately after the war. This was a, a camp in Amersfoort where uh, the uh, where the Nazi it wasn't where the Nazis put their also their prisoners, and the Dutch government took it immediately after the war immediately over, and I was appointed medical officer at that time, and uh, the 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 diet was terrible, and they always they asked for a special meal, and one of the things I did okay or if you need a special meal meal. Um, you have to see really if you need it. So we pump your stomach, or, you know, put a tube in the stomach and cut the food out. And we did not give them anesthetic during this. Well, we didn't have any anesthetic. And we did that twice or three times. And then we decided uh, if they needed an extra food. Well, 
they stopped asking. They stopped that. asking after yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> mm. I think it's all revenge. <laughs> and by the way, talking about revenge and forgetting, and you know, I realized how terribly important it is to talk about it. And like the Holocaust Center, how terribly important of all this is. And so, and I tried to forget, it didn't work. And so that's why, you know, started talking. And my own personal um, uh, revenge, they asked me about revenge sometimes. And I said, well, I have a family now with, uh, I think there are 50 of us, you know, my children, grandchildren, and I have 21 great grandchildren. So it's amazing. So mm -hmm. it's a revenge because they didn't want us to live. So the revenge was having people. Well, Carla, we are so, so grateful to have you with us. Um, and I hope it's okay that I mentioned that you are 97 and an inspiration to so many of us. And I wanna conclude by reading um, a really nice comment that came in from Nicolette who wrote, I just wanna thank Carla for this wonderful talk. I never heard a survivor speak in real time. And I read her book last Sunday, sending a big hug to Carla by her fellow Dutchie Nicolette living in Kirkland. So thank you so much. And thank you so much, Ray, for Welcome. all of your run wonderful work and for being a part of this presentation. It's so, so special to have you both here. Thank you. Thank it's been you. An honor. You're welcome. So I also want to thank everybody who was joining in with us today for today's program. Um, this session was recorded and you'll find it on our website starting tomorrow. I want to also thank Richard Green, our Museum and Technology Director, who's running the technical side of this show behind the scenes. Also, a huge thank you to our Executive Director, Dee Simon, and to our entire team, Lori Warshall cohen Nicole Bella, Julia Thompson, Paul Regelbrug, Ellie Selesky, Amanda Davis, Rick Brewer, Katie Lawrence, Morgan Romero, and our interns, Nick Williamson, Mira Brown, Mia Cohen, and Henry Rogers. I hope you'll join us next Tuesday at noon for a presentation from a local author, Judy Temis, on her new memoir, Losing and Finding Jewish Identity, A Journey from Post-War Communist Hungary. It's an excellent book. I encourage you to read it. She writes about her life um, in 1969 when she was just five years old. She was left by her parents who were seeking to escape communist Hungary. Her father who was a Holocaust survivor and desperate to leave behind Hungary's government and the legacy of the Holocaust, used tourist visas to take his wife and their 12-year-old son to the West. But these visas came at a high price. One child would need to be left behind. And that was Judy, left with an anti-Semitic uncle in a destitute Hungarian village. Five-year-old Judy had to cope not only with her parents' apparent desertion, the questions about her real identity and what it means to be a Jew. I hope you will join us next week, Tuesday at noon. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next week. This concludes our program for today. <laughs>